continued the long path um, ever since then. It's intersected with Mr. Graves' music ever since. So please let me introduce Milford Graves. time that I've, I've done this in this role at the new school. Um, some people in the room know your work. Some people in the room know you. They may know my work. Some people in the room don't know your work. Because I have a story about knowing my work. <laughs> I don't know if my work is really known yet. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, never say you think you know someone. And I've seen people critique certain people over the years and they say this and they say that. And since you mentioned Albert Iowa's name, uh, I always tell people, especially people who weren't on the planet when Albert was alive and they've heard rec recordings, I said, you only heard one side of Albert on recordings. So you can spend a lot of hours and a lot of listening and think you have Albert down, which is not true. Albert played two different ways. First of all, there's a photograph I wish I had, and maybe I have to contact Lewis Warrell, bass player who's down, I think, North Carolina now. He's, he left New York years ago. I think it was a little too stressful for him. And I saw this picture, and I said, that's Albert? It was a picture of Albert in the United States Army. And he was a honky-tonk player. He had his hair all like the old James Brown style, all honky-tonk up. He was honky tonk you know, free jazz, avant-garde. That was after the situation. Okay, so I don't know Albert Allen as a honky-tonk player, but I know him as the player that I played with in public and recorded with. But I also know him as the player that uh, one time came over to my house. And you're hearing this from me right now, that the story they, they put out that Albert cracked the ceiling in my house is false. He did not crack the ceiling in and, and my house. I was living in East New York, Brooklyn. I don't know if anybody knows East New York. I was uh, New, New Knox in Alabama, and I was in these old uh, kind of like brownstone type of buildings. So Albert came over and I was in my little small bedroom. So I had my little drums all tight, you know, all tight around me. And uh, Albert took out his horn and Albert looked up at the ceiling. And he saw my ceiling wasn't in great shape. You see the cracks and, and so on. So he said, do you have a rag? I said, yes, I have a rag, Albert. And he, and he took it and stuffed it in his horn. He said, because I don't want to crack the ceiling, so it'll cave in. <laughs> so, but he never played nothing to crack it, man. So he could have cracked it, I don't know. But you know, uh, Albert probably had the biggest sound I have heard on alto and tenor, the two instruments. He had an enormous sound. And his brother, he was very limited. Don was very limited on trumpet. He had a certain thing that he played on trumpet, but he played it, that one thing. We played at Slugs uh, back in 67, uh, I think it was, old Slugs. And it was a challenge because we played five nights in three sets. And this was a, ch a challenge for so-called avant-garde free jazz or some people say energy music. So I remember Don Poland coming the first night and he said, you ain't gonna be able to play like that for five nights. I said, you watch, Don. <laughs> and I, I did play for five nights in three sets. And every, th every time I think I would cool out, it didn't work. 
because two drummers that came down, I'm a young guy, you know, 67. So how could you relax when I'm looking out there and I see a younger Roy Haynes out there? See Philly Joe, I said, I gotta do it. Because this, this time, you know, well this guy knows, you know, Wilfred Graves, I'm the new kid on the block, you know? So it, you gotta check Wilfred Graves out. So I fell for that. When people come in, I got to do it, I got to do it. I got to live up to this rep. So I was laid up for about two or three weeks after that. <laughs> and I found, I found out that I am not going to play a certain kind of energy in no club for five nights and three sets. No way. After the second set, Albert came and told me, he said, we got to play some ballads. <laughs> See, I, I, Albert was powerful for that no, no, no one hour gigs we did in the loft. But to play three sets, three one hour sets, and blow out? After the second set, Albert came and said, he said, man, I just swallowed pieces of my, my reed, man. <laughs> he was blowing so hard. And so these are the little stories, you know, about, you know, the so-called energy music of how he was playing in the 60s. And if you weren't around in the 60s to hear it, I don't know if you can really say that you know what this music was really about. <clears throat> it was pure, pure, just high power projection. You got to remember that period. That was a tough period. This started, with me, it started in 1964. And I came on the scene in 1964. 1964, a lot of stuff going on in the country here. <laughs> Vietnam War was going on, civil rights, a lot of student revolutionary groups, the Weathermen, SDS, Black Panthers, you name it. You know, women's lib movement, it was like out here. The energy in the country was power. Everything was just power. It was combinations then of, of poets and, um, and paintings, dancing. We did have that collaborative type of thing. And what you see now, but you know, it's a certain kind of conviction that, you know, and I see, I said, it's not there. It's like, it's like doing a show. You know, what's your deep motivation for doing what you do? And that's something I just wanted to try to enhance on, you know, because uh, people say to me that, um, but let me stop at this point. We got a nice little room here, and, and my philosophy right now is as long as we tell the truth, when we have a gathering like this here, we have no problem. You know, we, let's talk the truth, let it out. You know, not no negative uh, critique, but let's do some positive critique. You know, the why's and the how's. Well, I don't like it, you know, because you tried to tell me why I should like it. I like conversations like that, because then we get across, everybody leaves with something. So the thing we hear today, uh, the thing I hear uh, a lot today, uh, and uh, I did mention it to, to Philip. I said, coming to the new school? And I know a lot of concept of the new school, I know the way they teach. I said, I don't want to come up there and be a disturbing or revolutionary <laughs> and contradict your teaching program up here. <laughs> you know, I'm saying, that's why I said, I would just lay it out like, why I do what I do and why some other magicians do what they do and why I didn't go for a lot of like uh, things from the, the business world to do less of what I could do or the potential of what could be done and, and, and speak in, uh, 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 in, in simple words is to sell out. People ask me another thing. They ask me something else. They said, is it true that you turned down a gig with Miles Davis? I said, I turned down a gig with Miles Davis twice. <laughs> I'm not going to use Miles Davis nobody to try to put myself out there. I think that's the worst thing you can do, is to take a gig to try to get some publicity. Don't do that. You know, then you cheat yourself. Put yourself out there before, because, because you can say, well, I'm capable of putting myself out. It's a belief system that you have to put in yourself. If you don't believe in what you can do, then forget about it. Get off the scene. Don't be thrown around and be manipulated. Um, I turned out a gig with Miles Davis because it was about 1962. Uh, a friend of mine uh, said that uh, he wanted to take me to Birdland to hear a friend of his. And my friend's name was Bill Fitch. I don't know how many people have heard of Bill Fitch. Does anybody know Bill Fitch? Okay, you know, it's a shame that we don't know Bill Fitch. These are stories you may not hear, but I'm going to tell you. 
about the business and what goes on and what motivated me. I met Bill Fitch in around 1960 and 1961. Uh, I had a, a, a co-led Latin jazz kind of Caribbean band with a piano player named Ray McKinley from Queens. So we had this band, we was playing a lot of dance band music and stuff, Calypso and the Latin jazz that we thought, but he was a Horace Silver kind of guy. So, uh, but he was the kind of guy that you have to turn around and say, hey Ray, uh, man, uh, you're playing the Motuna on, 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 on you, you, you emphasizing two and four, this ain't jazz like Horace, <laughs> you know? So the stuff was going, ding 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 all of a sudden you're going, da ka doom, ga 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 ka doom. You know what I mean? You're going up oh, instead of da ta doom, da ta doom. So uh, anyway, uh, speaking of that, um, you ask me, uh, you know, like maybe what's the format? What are we going to do? And for me, you know what it's going to be in here today? Improvisation. I don't know what I'm going to say one minute from now. But well, I'm gonna try to make some sense of it. I'm gonna try to tag it on to something else. <laughs> right. But when I hear like da da goon, da da goon, da da goon, there's some, I think, some mistakes that's been made. Uh, let me get my head together. What's this guy's name now? He was a Cuban uh, musician, a composer, man. Ah, oh, man. Horrible, man. Fame on me. Uh, oh man, this is back in the 50s. And Fernandez, Ortiz Fernandez. Fernandez Ortiz. Fernando Ortiz. Fernando Ortiz. He wrote that book on Bata. Yeah. He tried to write on that Bata. And everybody said, man, he's writing the stuff wrong. But, now are you from, are you from the towns of the drums in Cuba? Or are you from the conservatory in Cuba? Two different things, man. There's been a lot of screw-up in translations, man. People always, they, they get the, the screw-up is between eighth notes and eighth note triplets. And a lot of times when it should be an eighth note triplet, it should be the second eighth note triplet in the pattern and not the eighth note, the second eighth note, man. Because there's a small difference, you understand, in this. It's not a dot, 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 anything like that. It's a millisecond difference. I always tell people, the symbols is one thing. Learn how to deal with it in a time basis where you understand the millisecond value of the difference between a bop and boom. That makes the difference. That makes the difference, man. And so when you're going like, uh, 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 never think of it like, ding, 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 ding. The eighth note is really when you hear the congados who's playing So when you hear the eighth note, it's never like one and two and three and four and no, 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 no. You can make, you can make, you can make the pulses in between each bong, ding, bong, ding, bong, ding, so your body is like, like one and two and uh, going to the goon and um, that sound bam, uh, 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 the continuity you don't have the space between one and then your flow going you become very stiff so you want to ride on it even you're playing gang one dan doom dan doom ride not dan doom dan doom be careful of that okay that's non-cardiac. Our body does not beat like this. There's a different pulse. There's a different pulse like that there. The body vibrates and trips. That's how they vibrate, man. All of us vibrate. That's, that's how we vibrate. All right, this is my research over the last so many years of recording, getting biosignals, using millisecond system, not notation, if it's this quarter note, eighth note, sixteenth note, none of that. 
You know, it's a different sequence. And you'll find that we go, boom. When you see it, do pulsate on the multiples of two. You know, like two, four, eight, sixteen. You understand? That kind of system. What happens is, if your heart pumps like that, your blood doesn't flow out. It doesn't flow out. It shoo, 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 it spurts. You don't want that. You can see that on any echocardiogram picture. You can see all of that. When your, when your pulse is like that, boom, bam, boom, bump. So my question is, and this is what I, I the question I ask. I'm sitting back and I'm saying, I'm going to step out this here, but the question I ask, why do we teach rhythm a certain way? And why do we put emphasis on a metronome, what I think a metronome should be tossed. I think a metronome should be tossed. That's anti-biological rhythm. Bacchus was the first one who put together uh, a pacemaker. He was a fuse originator. And he got the blueprints from popular science off of a metronome. And they had to change that. They had that pacemaker a beat on the concept of a metronome was totally anti the body. Because the brain's up here. The brain, the brain, the heart connection will revolt against that. Say, what are you doing? When we play certain kind of rhythms and they're structured and packed in a certain kind of way, when the eardrum starts to vibrate, the eardrum is saying, the eardrum is saying, first of all, <laughs> to incoming vibes, who are you? What are you doing trying to make me vibrate like this here? So the internal self has to do, go through an adaptive process and they have to change it around, change it around. It's like a detoxification principle. We know a lot about the food we eat. We know how the body detoxifies what we show and put in, but as far as the yin, we're, we're very poor in that. You may be conscious of what you eat. A lot of people are more conscious of what they eat. I, I see physicians are very conscious of what they eat. Well, I'm a, I'm a vegan, I don't do this, I don't do that, and blah, 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 blah. They know the ingredients and blah, 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 blah. I said, this is, enough, this is a receptor. This is a receptor to bring solid foods that contain various elements to build our body. This is also a receptor. This is for sound. This is for sound. You got to know what green is supposed to go in here. You don't know the green is, that's terrible. Now, this is when I get in trouble when I went to some places and I've been to some places and people from church said, Look at you, sir. Look at what is this guy talking about? <laughs> I said, I just want to lay it down to you. Now, whatever you want to do with it, that's your business. I'm saying why I do what I do, you know, and why I do it. So I'm saying that I think the curriculum really has to be thought about of how we teach. What are we teaching? And then the older people will stop saying that the younger people don't know what the hell's happening. I think they do know what's happening. Just the fact that you want to go and do something, you want to pick up a horn, a, a, a string instrument, a reed, a brass instrument, you know, a, 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 mem a membrane instrument, just the fact that you want to do that, no, you do want to do something. It's the information that's given to you. You need information. If the information's not given to you, you want to do what's given to you. Now, some people say, and I know one of my, my guys was supposed to be here, and I wish he was here, one of my old partners. I would like him to tell a story that in 1964, we sat on the park up at Morningside. He saw me in 1964 at the October Revolution play. And he came to me, he's looking at me, and then he wanted to just connect with me. So we connected, and uh, he, uh, at that time, he was going to Madness, you know, he was well-trained in private schools, you know, the whole nine yards, reads, keyboards, so on, so on. But he liked what I was doing, but the understanding wasn't there. He said, well, I don't know what you're doing, man, but I like it. And uh, Billy Hart said that to me one time. I think he's okay if he said this here. I was at, I was at Sweet Basil's, I was at the Sweet Basil's with Peter Brosman and, and William Parker. And so Billy Hart was sitting about where he's sitting in the front row. So Billy Hart was sitting, he got to sit, and he was wet from my drums looking. I said, okay, Billy, he said, all right. <laughs> another drum. You know how it is when another person play your instrument, same instrument, they sit in front of you. You know, you say, okay, 
it's time to go ahead and do it. You know, you, you're talking to him. You know, he said, you ain't playing, you're relaxing. Now I'm going I'm I'm to feed you. You know, I'm going to feed you, man, make you feel good, whatever. So Billy ain't saying nothing. He ain't moved. He's just looking at me the whole set. And he came over to me and he said, you know, man, I don't understand what you're doing, but I like it. <laughs> and that was good enough. Because after, a, I guess after a few, a few, a few minutes there, he probably said, I ain't gonna try to figure this guy out. I'm just gonna check it out and relax and listen. And that's what you gotta do sometimes. You know, if you don't understand something, get out of your shell, or maybe what you think you're supposed to know, because uh, you may feel like you're being tested and say, you know what? Uh, let me just relax and let me take it in. And I think you'd be much, much better off that way. Much better off. Is there any questions at this time? Uh, yeah. I, I just want to ask because you, you mentioned this had Bill Fitch in it. Oh, Bill Fitch. I'm, I'm glad you brought me back into reality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went <laughs> off a second. I'll do that. You know, you got to bring me back in. Listen, <laughs> listen to me closely. Listen to me closely. I mean, you know, listen, when I go off, remember where I ended before I, you know, went to another diversion someplace. Bring me back in. Because I'll sit here and start thinking, and I forget about the audience. I say, yeah, Bill, we was like, blah, blah. And I said, oh, yeah, we're a good audience here. <laughs> so bring me back in, please. I'm going to tell you. It's not getting old, neither. It's just these no, stories got a prof has a profound effect on you, you know? So Bill Fitch, we had this band with Ray McKinley. And so this guy from uptown Manhattan Hall, uh, somehow he knew about me, and I had this band. So he wanted to come out to Queens to hear us doing a rehearsal. So he said, you know, man, there's a young guy, man, in from New Haven, Connecticut, who's a cool player, man. This guy's unbelievable, man. You got to hear this guy. I said, well, bring him around. So he came to the rehearsal, and he sat there. I said, you want to sit in, man? Come on, man, grab the drum. He grabbed that drum, and I said, I went over there and said, that's the new cool player, man, right away. And it was my childhood buddy who was playing, man, but I told, him, I told him, I said, man, this guy's good, man. I said, I got to go with this guy. I got to go with this guy. So Bill came on the scene, and for about one year, man, we just played together for one year. He, I was living in the housing projects. I was living in the South Jamaica housing projects in South Jamaica, Queens. And I had the free run. My mother would leave out, man, and we'd be up there from morning, afternoon to morning. We'd just be playing, man. And Bill would be playing conga. I played tambales. He'd get on tambales. I played conga, and bongo, conga, whatever. We'd switch around. And we had a thing, whereas he would play tumbal. Two hours we had a set, that's what he do. And I took tumbal and stole for two hours. <laughs> then I come back, and Bill go, tumbal and stole. Two hours, we do bongo. We could do the set, do the set. And we got to know each other, it was unbelievable how we was picking up on each other. But the one thing about Bill, and this is the kind of thing we had with each other. He was saying, man, he said, the way you play a cowbell beat, man, it ain't like Tito Puente. Everybody was doing that one. I had some other kind of stuff. My, my wrist, I can't even remember that now, man. My wrist was exact. Did he got to do that? I was out on guard on the bell beat. But he liked it. <laughs> my hand was turning over, man, because I was feeling that stuff, man. I was just gone, man. But I was right in there. You know, I was in that 4-4 plan. I was right in there. And everything I would do, he said, man, you're different. You got another kind of way of playing, man. He said, but I liked it. But with Bill, so, man, he can imitate everybody. Chano Pose or Mondo Parraza, Mongo Santa Maria. At 19 years old, this guy was extremely advanced. He had come down from Berkeley. He was hanging out with Alan Dawson. He had all the guys up there, man. So he can play bass. He can play a, 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 a piano, man. This guy had it down. And so anyway, I was checking this guy, and he was checking me out. And I got to say, man, this guy, I had super high respect for this guy, man. Because I had never met a guy that we were the same age that had a certain kind of knowledge. And uh, he, he would write these charts. He'd write all the tunes, man. And we had these little local gigs, okay? So uh, we played these ballrooms. 
the ballroom dancers. And so all my guys from the house of frogs, everybody would come from the end. So uh, my nickname was Modi Gruff. That was my nickname, my street name, Modi Gruff. So everybody come and just say, yeah, Modi, man, Gruff. Either Modi or Gruff or Modi Gruff. He doing this gig, man. Everybody got to come. So all my buddies be coming there. Everybody be all wind up, you know, they be all drunk, man. <laughs> they in the ballroom, man. Everybody dancing, and my guys be lined up. Modi, check Modi out, check Modi. And I'm the star of the community you know, for the weekend dance, man. So Bill had these charts, man. He had all these charts. So I come up the stage. They said, um, yo, Modi, you read that music? I said, yeah, man, ain't nothing to it. I wasn't reading no notes. <laughs> I was fronting for days, man. I was looking at that paper, and I was. I see my dudes looking at me, it's like. <laughs> I wasn't reading one thing out, but I had a hell of a memory. You played that sucker. I remember that, man. I can remember, man. That's what I depended on. So anyway, Bill was the guy who taught me how to read. He said, "I'm gonna teach you how to read all this stuff here." So I was really humbled down to this guy, but he humbled down to me, man. We had this kind of respect for what the other ones are doing. So I said, oh, so that's what they do, huh? I said, you know what, man? Well, you know, that's cool, man. But why don't we do it like this? For example, we listened to, at first I was listening to every record that Cal Jada had ever put out. When he had Willie Bobo and Mongo. Okay, I had, I had, I had, I had Willie, I had Willie Bobo down. You know? But then I said to um, uh, there was one lick that they do. I said, Bill. I'd rag that thing up, and, you know, scrub board it, man, up. And we do stuff like that. We turn it all around. I said, that's hip man. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Bill said, hey, man, he said, you know what, man, that piano player, he said, he's okay. But I got a piano player coming down from Boston, man, that can play more tuna better than this cat, man. So he said, I'm going to bring him out to the next rehearsal. So he brought him to this guy, Ray McKinley's house, who lived in Hollis, Long Island. So this guy comes down. He says, I want you to meet my piano player here I told you about. Uh, it was Chick Corea. All right? So Chick comes down. He went on. Chick was about 18. So I think I got Chick by a year. So Chick comes down, man. He sits down. I look at Bill. I said, hey, man, that band is finished. I said, new band. <laughs> I said, I'm keeping the bass player. So we had two bass players. We had one bass, play, bass player was um, uh, a guy named Noel Carter. And then the other bass player was in the band uh, was, uh, you probably know him, Lyle Atkinson. Lyle Atkinson lived a few blocks from me. So I said, no, man, Lyle Atkinson, man. Lyle Atkinson was, at the time, he was going to Manhattan. So he had this kind of technology with Chick had, you know. So Chick said, man, I got a great alto player, man. Uh, he said, man, this guy sounds like Charlie Parker. Pete Yellen. Do you know Pete Yellen? He's good. Pete Yellen's good, man. I don't know what he's doing now, but at that time, people, man, if they heard demos we did, they would say, I never heard Charlie Parker play in a setting like that. We said, that's Pete Yellen, man. <laughs> so we had this band that was a monster band, man. So I used to hang down on Broadway a lot. I had my slick shoes on, my slick cutaway suits. I had a briefcase, man. I was all clean shaved, and I'd walk into all these uh, booking agencies, man. <laughs> I'd say, hey, I have a Latin jazz band. I had this kind of, you know, thing about me. <laughs> I said, we're pretty good, you know, we're pretty good. He said, any things that you can uh, give us for the weekend, and blah, blah. And the guys, a lot of times, they used to like me. They wanted to talk to me. They'd be bored there. They had no gigs for me. So one time I went to this guy, man. I even talked about three or four times. They said, come on and hang out, just to keep conversation. So one day, he says, by the way, I never asked you, who do you have in your band? I said, blah, 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 Chick Corea. He says, Chick Corea's in your band? He said, that guy can play. He was also a piano player. He says, I got an engagement for you. He says, this engagement is going to be at Town Hall. And he says, Herbie Mann's going to be on. Cal Jada's going to be on. And uh, uh, the, the Cuban Jam Session band. I said, oh, are you kidding me, man? He said, no, you guys are going to open up. So I ran back and told Bill. Bill said, what? We the first band on. Cal Jetta had, he, was, he hadn't got there yet when we went on. But Willie Bobo was there. We blew Willie Bobo away, man. And that, for me, 
that Willie Bobo coming up, man, you young cats, man. That was it for me. I said, wow, man, Willie Bobo came over, man. I said, this is fantastic, man. So anyway, short the story up. Cal Jada had a conguero, a congo player named Mungito. And Mungito had got arrested and Cal Jada, Cal Jada needed a congo player. Cal Jada was calling everybody back. He was trying to get, he wanted a, he wanted Mongo back, he wanted a Mondo, he, 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 he uh, uh, wanted um, all the guys, man. He was calling everybody, man. Willie Bobo said, no man, there's a young kid in New York, man. So Bill calls me up and tells me, man, Cal Jada calls me, man. And Cal Jada asked him to come out to California. So Bill said, should I go? I said, no, you go, man. He went out to California. And I seen Willie, I seen, uh, uh, I seen, I seen uh, uh, Willie Bobo in a restaurant down 52nd Street and Broadway. And I went up and started talking to him. Willie had his head down. He said, man. I said, what's happening, Willie? He said, man, all the cats is on me, man. They on me, man. Willie Bobo got a lot of static, man. Because he hired a non-Hispanic guy on the team to play Congo. And Willie said, why did you do it? Willie said, I told him that he can play better than all the Spanish cats. Well, Willie, uh, Bill, Bill Fitch went out to California. When he came back, he was a disaster. He came back, he was a disaster. Because, man, he came off the stage, all the cats were turning their back on him, man. And he was so much into the Hispanic community, he wanted to be so much into the cats and everything, man. And they didn't accept him, man. And he came back, man. He, I don't know where you know him from. I know him from Don Elias. And or Don. I heard you talk about that. Okay, well that's how I, I met Don Elias through Bill Fitch. Okay, through Don Elias, man. And uh, when Bill came back to New York, oh man, he used to write me these letters. He said the only guy that took him in and accepted him was Armando Peraza. He lost it, man. He went down from this to that, man. Psychologically, he wasn't ready to take that whole big set, you know. But Billy, Bill is in like, what is that, the Hall of Fame? I think they put him in that. Now they talk about him. They said, man, this guy was one of the greatest guys around, man. Bill took that conga and his concept of playing, he took everything and he played it within such a, a musical perspective, man. That was the way he can play with the bands, man. He changed that whole concept around. When he came back, because we had all these kind of things worked out, man. And uh, he came back, he said, man, you know, you got, you got to be typical, man. I said, Bill, what are you talking about, man? You play straight, man. No nothing. Just play straight. I said, Bill, no, 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 no. I said, that's not where it's at. So when Bill came to the October Revolution, when I played down there, Bill came. He was halfway still together. And I finished playing. I think I was with Paul Blake. I played with Paul Blake at that, that time. And I came over to him, man, and he looked at me. And that's something that stuck into me up until this day. I said, when I left that day, I said, if I scared Bill Fitch, I must be doing something. Because ain't too many guys scared that guy, man. Not too many guys scared Bill Fitch. Nobody did. And I said, wow. That's why I had to check myself and said, what am I doing, man? Because I was just doing what I do. I just felt good doing what I'm doing. I never looked at it like being this or that. Never tried to be way out to anything. But we started with Bill Fitch because Bill Fitch took me to Birdland. Right. Okay, and Bill Fitch, he took me down there to see Tony Williams. Because him and Tony Williams was uh, uh, friends up in Boston, man. So I went down to see Miles, man, and Tony, young Tony's up there, Ron Carter, Herbie Hancock, man, and they're playing, man. And they felt good. You know, the trio part felt good. And Miles was up there, man, Miles turned around, shut your hand, Miles, you ain't playing ass. And that shocked me, man. Birdland's packed. I said, you know what? I will not take a gig when someone turns around and tells you something like that. I wouldn't take that, man. Miles told me that. I would have walked off the stage, man, and told Miles, you play the drums. 
I refuse to play with anybody, man, who would treat their other man members in the worst kind of way, disrespectful, anything like that. So I didn't need it, man. So I made a decision. I made a decision, which Bill Dixon told, asked me in 1973, at 1972 actually, asked me, we were on sabbatical up in, up in Bennington. I went up there and, and played a concert, he asked me to come up. And he went on sabbatical with Wisconsin after Cecil had did it first. Then Bill went up, and Bill asked me to uh, you know, do a sabbatical. I said, nah, Bill, nah, nah, I don't teach no college, man. I ain't teaching no college, I ain't doing none of that. Then 1973, when uh, Bill was asked to form a black music department up there, Bill called me up and said, great, man, you want to come up here and, you know, and teach, man? I said, nah, Bill, I ain't going to no college to teach. I ain't going to no class to teach nobody. Bill said, Graves, you're going to get a paycheck, Graves. I said, a paycheck, huh? <laughs> so I ain't getting no money playing this free jazz, a paycheck. At this time, you know, what we had, the, the five kids. They had the five kids, man. I said, wait a minute, man, I got to feed everybody, pay some rent. I said, I'm going to try it. I went up there, and the guy said, we can give you a three-year contract. I said, no, a contract is a contract. I'm signing that. I said, one year. I got to see, see how I like it. After the one year, he said, well, I can give you, you know, additional two years. I said, I think I'll try it. <laughs> After that, three years, I think I'll try it. And I stayed there for 39 years. <laughs> I never expected that. 39 years. Because at Bennington for 39 years, nobody ever bothered me. Nobody bothered me. I designed my class. Nobody told me what to do. How do you want to turn on a gig like that? I'm up there six months out of the year, but I'm paid for 12 months. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If I, if I have to do something, uh, if I got to do a gig, I told somebody to come on up. I said, hey, man, you want a gig for two or three weeks? Take it. I'm going to be on the road or something, man. And I just had to get out there after 39 years. I didn't have to leave. Because I don't know if you know the two people that I did recommend that, you know, well, I, I recommended um, two people, and they both got the job. And the college, uh, the president liked her, and they created an extra class, and that was Susie Ibarra. So I said, let's go, let's go for Susie and, and Michael Wormley, because Michael Wormley had been coming out to see me, and I got to know Michael Wormley. I said, I think he can do that job. He can do the job up there. Because I said, I have to get out of the system. If I do teach, it's going to be private at my spot. I want to change things around where I got more resources that I want. And I think I said, take a rest. I really had to take a rest. I had take a rest, and after the point, you know, I, I can't keep teaching. I gotta teach the people who maybe has got their basics together, more professionals. And I don't like to even say teach, I hate to use that word, because when you use that word sometimes, after a certain point, eagles come in. You know, eagles. I know different musicians, some drummers come out to visit me. Uh, their ego gets in the way. They don't wanna be a student. I said, I'm not gonna, you don't have to be no student, man. You know, it's about information, man. You know, it's about information. You never get to the point where you think that no one can teach you or show you something. You're finished. You're finished. Don't ever do that. Especially if you see somebody, somebody has something. And, you know, 